right, everybody. So we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you this morning Patrick Berry. Patrick is the CEO and co-founder of Blue Box Security Incorporated and Blue Box Technology Holdings. Patrick oversees the corporate direction and strategic vision of Blue Box. His passion is developing innovative products and marketing them through the channel. Before starting Blue Box, Patrick served as president of G4S Technology Software Solutions for three years, which was formerly Touchcom. Prior to that, he spent 15 years as co-owner and senior vice president of sales and engineering for Touchcom, which is a leading supplier of innovative security systems to commercial real estate, corporate facilities, and financial institutions. There, Patrick built, launched, and managed the first cloud-based security program for the physical security marketplace. He held a variety of management, operations, engineering, sales, and marketing roles that led to the successful sale of the company to G4S Technology in 2008. Patrick studied electrical engineering at Stony Brook University and Union College in New York. So please uh, give me a hand in welcoming Patrick Berry. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to sharing the information I have with you today. Uh, so <clears throat> for starters, the name of the, of the title for the uh, presentation is How to Earn 40 Cents on Every Dollar of Installed Equipment. Now, 40 cents sounds like a small number, but just do the math. What did you install last year in terms of equipment? If you're not sure, take your total revenue and then take 50% of it, and that's about what you installed in terms of equipment. Now, multiply that by 0.4, and that's how much recurring revenue you should have uh, earned or generated just in last year. By a show of hands, how many people generated that much recurring revenue? Okay, you can go to sleep. Everybody else? Maybe there's something I have to teach you. So uh, that's, what, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I spent the last 15 years um, essentially doing that, and I'm going to show you uh, exactly what I did and how I did it. So uh, the agenda, a um, little background. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The mega trends and uh, observations, talk to you a little bit about physical security as a service. Uh, talk about the uh, business model that we used, show you exact uh, examples of um, pricing and how it all works, um, show you the financial results, and uh, show you some other things, techniques that we use to help garnish that uh, recurring revenue, and then just wrap it up for you. I don't think we're going to have time for questions, uh, given the material I'm going to cover, but if you see me out in the hall or whatever, you want to have a conversation, just pull me aside, send me an email, whatever. Okay. Uh, experience, you heard a little bit about my background already, so I don't want to spend a lot of time going over it. But basically, over the last 15 years, uh, I've um, been selling physical security as a service. Um, we have, I've heard pretty much every question that you would ever be asked. I've built the software uh, that integrators uh, can sell, that end users want. I've developed all the pricing models. I know what they want, how much they'll spend, how long they're customers for, and why they remain customers. We had our own data centers, so I know about data center and IT security and cybersecurity. We sold uh, this software to some of the largest companies in the world, Bank of America, Comcast, um, Wells Fargo, some of the most prestigious and valuable real estate in the world throughout the United States corporate customers, schools, banks, industrial. Okay. Technical difficulties.
Can I test? Mike? Better? Good. All right. There we go. Okay, uh, okay so um, delivered uh, to, the, to a large uh, variety of verticals. Um, uh, 2011, we were doing $30 million a year, and 15 million of that 30 was recurring revenue without a single alarm contract or license with less than 1% attrition, down to about a half a percent attrition. Those were our stats. Um, <clears throat> and then um, ultimately we sold the company for about 84 times uh, annual recurring revenue. And just like uh, we heard yesterday, it was a combination of the recurring revenue, uh, the engine that created that recurring revenue, software that we had developed, and, um, and some goodwill and things like that. So it, everything that you heard yesterday, absolutely true in terms of valuation and what you can get by generating a recurring revenue for your company. Uh, and then I started uh, Blue Box in 2013, took those 15 years experience, got a, you know, using a brand new, brand new platform, and created, you know, stepped back as a uh, systems integrator, being a manufacturer, and now provide that to everyone. It's an enterprise class product that scales all the way down to SMB and does the same work that I was doing in the, in the previous company. <clears throat> okay, so in, in the last three years and talking to integrators like yourself, I've heard everything there is to hear about why they, they don't generate recurring revenue. Uh, you need to be a big company, you need capital, you need to host systems, you need a different sales force, on and on and on. And I can tell you that every single one of those reasons is 100% untrue. And I hope in the next hour I'm going to be able to dispel some of those um, misperceptions about recurring revenue. So about the presentation, this is a documentary, not a fiction and not science fiction. Everything I'm telling you is based upon 15 years of experience, fact, financial results, and everything. All, everything that I'm telling you has been done before. All right, so if it's been done 15 years ago, it can certainly be done now, and it can certainly be done uh, better. So mega trends and observations. You heard this one yesterday. Everything is a service, right? And around 2000, and then accelerated again in 2007 by the iPhone, um, our culture has become an everything we get served by everything as a service. And you just look at everything that's on there. In everyday life, we shop through Amazon and eBay. We order our cars through Uber and, and Lyft, right? Our housing, Airbnb and home away. Businesses, you know, PayPal, bank, right? Our information, all of that. Everything is delivered to you as a service. And every day that goes on, there's a new service that's out there that we consume. This is our life. We use our iPhones to do this. Now, what is the financial and business model behind all this stuff? On demand, subscription based, pay as you go, recurring revenue. Is there any reason in the world why security won't be this model too? Do you really think that we're going to escape this vortex? No possible way. Right? So we're heading there at lightning speed, and they've already told you what the business model is going to be. Lowest total cost and highest capability. You've probably heard this a million times from your customer. This is what I want. I want the most for the least amount of money. It sounds great, but what do you need to do in order to actually provide that? You break it down. The total cost of ownership of a security system is the cost of the software and the service agreement that goes along with it, the cost of the hardware, and all maintenance that goes along with it. And then the cost to design the systems, sell the systems, install the systems, and then ultimately support the systems, the manpower component, right? Those are the three components. But if you look at each one of those components separately, you'll notice that for software, as a function of time, costs go down, capability goes up. For hardware, costs go down, capability goes up. And they happen exponentially. That's just Moore's law. And manpower, Cost goes up, and if you're lucky, the capability stays the same, right? That's reality. So if I want the lowest total cost, if I want to provide to my customers the lowest total cost, what am I going to do? I increase the software component of my offering, I increase the hardware component of my offering, but only when it replaces manpower. 
If it doesn't replace manpower, I try and reduce it because there's a maintenance cost that's associated with it. And then for manpower, I try and reduce that as much as possible. That's how I achieve lowest total cost. So the systems that you're putting in today, you should think of it in these terms. Are you doing these things to minimize manpower, do that double balance with hardware, and increase the software component? That will give you lowest total cost of ownership. On the capability side, just applying those same curves, you would increase the cost of soft, uh, increase the uh, software because that has ever increasing capability. Increase hardware, but only if it replaces manpower, and then try and minimize your manpower as much. And that's how you achieve this. This is another mega trend that you're just going to get ha have to get used to being able to provide. Stickiness. We heard a lot about stickiness yesterday. There is a science to stickiness, and I'm going to quickly explain it to you. There are 17 factors that form the stickiness with a customer. And I listed them up here, and you'll see them again on the slide. Relative scale, whether it's unique or not, whether it provides analytics or business intelligence, whether your solution changes the customer's operations, whether you bundle your software, whether you have provide continuous improvement, if it's competitively priced, does it reduce the cost for your customer? Does it reduce their risk? Uh, do you provide excellent customer service? Is there a co-mingling of services and products? Is it proprietary? Is the solution uh, hosted? Uh, is it a solution to their problem? Um, ongoing consulting, do you need ongoing consulting? Uh, does it solve an audit or compliance reason? So these are all the things that create stickiness with your customer. And you should look at your customers in this way. And how sticky am I with my customer? How do I do each of these things with your customer? And you can actually plot it, chart it. So if you're interested in knowing in what are the stickiest recurring revenue sources, I've done the math for you. So across the top is all those 17 characteristics. Then you take your, all your recurring revenue uh, sources down the side, and you scale what they are. How do you score them against each one of those characteristics? And when you do that, you come up with a, a stickiness score. Then you take the margin that you typically get from each one of those uh, types of recurring revenue, and you multiply your margin time the stickiness score, and that is how valuable that recurring revenue is in terms of stickiness. Right? So when you do that, you'll see I put everything in order for you. So your, your, most, your most valuable and your stickiest form of recurring revenue is software as a service, followed by analytics, software support, hardware as a service, monitoring, hardware support, supplies, and so forth you can read, and then manpower at the very end. So this is the science behind Sticky. And if you take each one of your customers and you plot it against, well, how am I doing uh, for that customer in each one of these things, you'll get a score, a stickiness score for each of your customers. And if I'm in your shoes, I would be trying to drive that stickiness as high as I possibly can. And the reason you want to do that is because if you've got recurring revenue, and you heard this yesterday, the value of that recurring revenue is tied to how long you keep that customer. So the stickier you are with your customer, the longer that relationship is, the more valuable your recurring revenue. Next, DIY, another mega trend. And just look at what we do, our, 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 the, our culture. Right? We have moved 100% to a DIY culture. Everything as a service is the ultimate DIY. That's what it's about is your ability to take control of your life and order your tickets and do whatever you want, do your banking, make reservations for a table, find any information out that you want. That is the ultimate DIY. Google and YouTube. How many of you have woken up on a Saturday morning, decided you wanted to sand your floors, went onto YouTube, looked at a video, went to Home Depot, bought a sander, came back, refreshed your memory again on the video, and sanded your floors? DIY. You, that's made uh, possible because of Google and YouTube. Um, user groups are the new tech support. How many of you have noticed that all the manufacturers in the world have fired their tech support and set up user groups, and the people that buy their products are now their customer support? DIY. Same thing with rating systems, right? They are the new consumer reports. We don't go to consumer reports. We look at all the ratings that all of you have provided to tell us how good something is. Another form of DIY. Banking, travel, entertainment. The arts. You write a song, you put it in SoundCloud, you're a, an artist overnight. You don't need a label, you don't need anything. All DIY. 
technology. These are six of the major trends that I see uh, for security. Cloud, mobile, biometric, unified, open, and smart. I won't spend a lot of time on that. You probably, hopefully you all agree because you're seeing all of that in everyday uh, life. A changing industry. So, our industry is not any different than any other industry in the world. It goes through cycles of change. You'll hear people use words like disruption. And our industry has gone through three, four cycles of change, starting in the 70s, where we had the beginnings of electronic security. And those cycles last about 15 years. Then we moved on to computer and software security. Then we moved on to IP and digital security. And now, if you just follow the timeline and you follow the technologies, we are in physical security as a service. And that is what's going to drive our industry for the next 15 years. And this chart just shows you, you know, all the major technologies that define our industry and how they've changed from generation to generation. And if you follow it, it becomes very clear that our infrastructure will be cloud and wireless, our computing devices will be our phones, mobile and wireless. Um, our credentials will be multi-factored and biometric. Our software will be web-based and all unified together. Our hardware will be open and wireless. Our uh, systems will be smart. And our video will be served to us as video as a service. So those are the mega trends. Uh, why are they important? It's because they are the tea leaves, they are the clues that tell you what you need to be doing in terms of a business. You know, where is, where is the industry going? Where will it go? It's all already there for you. You just need to read the tea leaves. That's what the, the importance of the megatrends are. And they form a backdrop to physical security as a service. So, what is physical security as a service as far as I'm concerned. It's providing security as a service instead of selling hardware uh, security products. Ingenious, right? But what do I really mean? Let's take it another step. If you're just selling hardware and installation and even support contracts, you're on that step every year going down because the cost of equipment, as you saw from the other slides, continues to go down. And you're going to follow that scale. You're going to follow that down to the bottom. It is absolutely a race to the bottom. You heard that term yesterday. That's what it is. If you follow the just selling hardware and putting in software and, and, and so forth, it is absolutely a race to the bottom. If you sell a service, if you sell physical security as a service, you're selling a service. And it does not matter what happens to the price of that hardware because you're selling a service, and that service has a value regardless of how you provide it. And that is the difference between physical security as a service and selling hardware and solutions like we're all doing today. Now, what are the services you're selling? People are confused by this. Well, you're, you're, you're selling hardware as a service. You're selling the service of doing all their data backups. You're selling them the service of providing redundancy. You're selling them the service of providing high availability by having multiple data centers that host their, their, their stuff. You're selling them cybersecurity protection. You're selling the ability to use their software on any device, anywhere, at any time by an unlimited number of people and give them real-time information totally connected to your security system. You're selling them the ability to do their own administration, to, to monitor their power, the health, the system of their monitor. These, that's what physical security as a service is, not selling hardware. So hardware is just a means to an end. It's just a way to generate these services. So how do you provide it? Well, instead of doing the things on the right-hand side, so instead of providing locally installed dedicated servers of NVRs, of storage, of client stations, and PCs and network infrastructure, sell them a cloud service. Instead of locally installing software on their systems, use software as a service. Instead of providing them time and material contracts, provide them a software contract, 
or, or rather a system support contract. Instead of doing hardware upgrades, provide them hardware as a service. Instead of doing uh, time materials, let them do DIY automated or managed services. Instead of supplies, sell supplies as a service. Instead of doing one-time purchases, do annual subscriptions. Instead of doing capital expense, offer operating expense. Instead of doing continuous degradation, provide for continuous improvement. Now, the mistake that people make is they think that they have to do everything on the left in order to be physical security as a service. It's 100% untrue. It is a spectrum that goes from providing everything as an uh, annual amount to providing exactly what you're doing today, which is having your customer buy all the equipment, and then on top of that, providing services that I just described. It's the entire spectrum. And you don't have to do, you can do a mix and match. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. As long as you're providing that service. So why build a business around it? So the strength of physical security as a service model is supported by four legs. Financial, technological, operational, and strategic. On the financial side, you heard a lot of this yesterday, right? It provides recurring revenue, it increases your company value, provides better cash flow, provides uh, a better, higher win ratio, and long-term stability through soft spot spots in the market. That, those are the benefits, the financial benefits. On the technology side, it, I just showed you that it provides lower tost, uh, cost of ownership, greater capabilities, provides uh, cybersecurity, everything as a service, and it's in line with security 4.0 technologies. Operationally, it handles the DIY model. It provides better and faster support, better customer satisfaction, more efficiency, and lower operating costs. And on the strategic side, it's sticky. It's, it provides a greater competitive advantage, more forgiveness, and less commoditization. So those are the four legs of the stool, that physical security. But the thing that I want you to really understand about this is that physical security as a service is aligned with all those megatrends. So all those tea leaves that I told you about that are, that are pushing your industry in a particular direction, physical security as a service is aligned with them. They're, they're all there. If you look at them, recurring revenue, lower total cost, DIY, sticky, all those megatrends are inherent in the physical security as a service model. The other thing I want you to realize is that it is a win-win for everybody. It is a win-win for your customers, and it is a win-win for you. Take a look. Do-it-yourself model, a win for the customer. Better support, a win for the customer. Better customer satisfaction, a win for them. Greater efficiency, a win for you and a win for them. Lower operating costs, a win for both of you. Stickiness, a win for you, right? Lower t total cost of ownership, a win for them. Greater capabilities, a win for them. Recurring revenue, a win for you. It has both parties thought of in the model, and that's why it works. So anyone that thinks that recurring revenue is good for you and not for your customers, you're 100% wrong for these reasons. And if you put this chart up in front of your customer, you will absolutely win their hearts. So what is the recurring revenue business model that we used and are using for the last 15 years. So first off, um, just to make the math simple for everybody, I picked typical systems just to show um, how much revenue you can generate and so forth. Obviously, this applies to a spectrum of, uh, of systems. So you've got a small system, a medium system, a large system, a very large system, an enterprise system, and a global system. Because this applies to the entire uh, spectrum of customers that are out there. There are some people that think that, that physical security as a service is just for SMB and small customers, 100% wrong. So um, typical systems, I use the assumption that 50% of the revenue uh, of the system is uh, equipment. So you'll see that you've got a column that's got the revenue of a typical small system and then the equipment that's that portion of, of the revenue. People will say it's 40%, it's 60%, Trust me, it's around 50%. So, what is the model? Pretty simple. Number one, there's seven buckets of recurring revenue that you should be thinking about. In addition to you selling your hardware, right? So this is just recurring revenue in addition to your hardware sales. So seven buckets. Number two, you interconnect these buckets so they don't move. They stay in place. You interlock them. And I'll show you how to do that. You, as a result, it generates high quality recurring revenue without really a contract. 
in the alarm industry, they go for those five-year contracts, which is fabulous. In our industry, I mean, I was never very successful at getting five-year contracts. I don't know about any of you. Best I got was a one-year contract with an evergreen type clause. But it's fine, because once you bring that customer in and you interlock them in the, in the, with the recurring revenue, they don't go anywhere. And when I show you all the other things, they don't move. Right? Our customers stayed with us 12, 15 years, way beyond the, 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 the five-year, the six-year, the seven-year that the alarm industry looks at. These are, these are low attrition, high quality, very good contracts without, without forcing your customer into having to sign a, a, a multi-year contract. It will provide less than 1% attrition. Uh, it'll double your company growth. You will generate between 25 cents and 50 cents on every dollar that you uh, put on, out into the field. You'll get four to eight times more margin dollars than your one-time sale. So if you made 100 bucks, you'll get $800 on recurring revenue, and that's just over a six or eight year period. If you double that, it'll be double that amount. So a huge amount of return in terms of, rev in terms of margin. Your margin will actually grow over time. You have a tremendous amount of pressure. Costs of equipment are sinking. Your margins are sinking. This model will actually grow your margins over time. And you will build a company that is 15 to 20 times more valuable than if you didn't do it. People are shocked by that number, but I'll show you the math, and it's totally clear. So the typical recurring revenue that you can generate from a small system, between one and $3,000. If you put in a $10,000 system, how many people generate between one and $3,000 every single time they put in that system? Probably not a lot of you, one. <laughs> or if I, gener if I put in a medium-sized system, 50K, 25,000 in recurring revenue, between three and $10,000 of recurring revenue. Now, another thing about this recurring revenue is what I call mailbox money, meaning that you do not have to do anything to earn it. There's no amount of manpower that you have to do to earn this money. It just comes to you because of what you've so sold, because of the platform that you sold, because you're selling a service. It's not a service that you have to provide as, in terms of manpower, it's just a, a physical security as a service. So anyway, you can see for global customers between two and $10 million, that may seem unattainable to you, but I guarantee you that our largest customers that we had paid us between two and $10 million a year in recurring revenue. I think, who was it uh, that was up here that was talking about the largest recurring revenue contract that they ever had? It was, I think, $70,000 a month, right? So ours was $500,000 a month. Okay, the seven buckets. First is your licenses. This is the tip of the spear. This is the glue that holds everything together, the most important part of providing physical security as a service, and I'll get into that more. Then you've got your support and maintenance contracts, hardware as a service, management services, supplies, digital credentials, and annual increases. Those are the seven buckets. If I'm you, I think of my customers as being connected to this. Every single one of my customers has a tap into each one of these buckets, and your job is to figure out how much I can get from in pouring into each one of these buckets from each one of my customers. If you think about your business in that way, you will shift everything about the way that you go to market, sell, win business, and even finance your business. This is how we interlock the recurring revenue. The top of the pyramid is that physical security as a service licenses. That is what holds everything together. That is the sugar, that is the candy, that is what the customers buy into and want. Everything is connected to that. When I provide software as a service and uh, physical security as a service, I say, if you want this, you have to take a support contract. I don't separate the two. That interlocks my licenses with my support contract. Then I offer up as an option to say, every six years, 
I'll give you brand new hardware. Pay me X dollars more a, a month, I'll give you brand new hardware every six years. That holds the support in place because you need the support contract in order to get the hardware as a service contract. So now I've got three uh, sources of recurring revenue interlocked. Then I come along and because I put in the uh, licenses, that enables me to provide all these managed services that I couldn't do before. Now, people think that managed services require manpower, and I'm going to show you that they don't. You can get managed service revenue and not lift a finger. So the f physical security as a service licenses provide you the ability to generate managed services. They also provide you the ability to get supplies, which your customers may be going onto the internet to buy today. And I'll show you how that happens. And then the uh, licenses also provide a way of doing digital credentials for you. And then all of that, those six buckets, are then every single year increased by three or four percent in an annual increase. And those are your seven buckets, and that's how they all interconnect and stay in place. So, the first one, licenses. Again, the most important, because it provides and holds all of your recurring revenue together. So how do you do that? What is, what is so sweet about this? Well, it's largely that list that I went through uh, before. So in order to really hold your customers in place, you need a lot of licenses that span across all the parts of security that you want to provide, and they have to offer differentiation as well. If you combine many licenses with a bunch of differentiation, you're bringing to your customer something that they can't get anywhere else. And that's what they want, that's what they hold on to. Once they bite into that, everything else is attached to it. So, number one, you sell the licenses up front with the sale. So you've got your equipment sale, and then you've got a line item for annu your annual licenses. Always sold up front. When you do that, it opens the door for all the other forms of recurring revenue that you're going to attach to it, like your support, like your hardware as a service. Because the software can be provided either as part of the equipment or without, you can go into any bid and provide just the equipment and remove the software. You'll end up being the low bid on pretty much every single bid. You'll get to the table, and then you bring in your spear, and you show them all the things that you can do as part of that, and then the rest of your competition doesn't know what hit them because they never made it to the table, and you're now doing things that weren't even part of the bid, and you've upsold the project. And that's what we did all day long in my previous company. So, most important part, and you can generate, on average, between 10 and 25 cents for every dollar of uh, equipment that you put out there. That's, in general, what happens. And I gave you some examples uh, just to show you what I'm talking about in terms of the different types of license types. You know, you have to be able to cover your platform, your access, your alarms, your video, photo ID, visitor management, vendor management, destination dispatch. Uh, we have a, a person reader device, uh, or a, type, a specific type of reader, audio and intercom, the whole shebang. But also things that you probably don't sell today, like digital credentials, like intelligence, like notifications, power management, system health, analytics, situational awareness, things like that. This is all, those, all the different licenses going down for that, that, those columns uh, that I just talked about. So not only being wide in terms of your breadth, but also going deep in terms of your capabilities. And then the differentiation. These are those 20 or so things that you can do with physical security as a service that you can't do with your traditional platforms today. This is why, this is the why customers buy this, because you're providing things that they can't do any other way. I'm not gonna take the time to go through all of them. You can have access to the presentation and you can read them. So system support. So now I've got, I've got the customer. They've just purchased all these licenses, and now I tell them, look, you need a system support contract. That is a line item in your proposal. You got your proposal, you list your licenses, and then your hardware maintenance contract. And you sell that the day that you sell the contract. You don't wait the following year to go back to them and talk to them. Salesmen won't do it. 
and it's a much more difficult sale. You sell it at the time of the sale, and it's a requirement. You want this, you have to take this. 99.9% .9 of all of our customers in my previous company had support contracts. The first two years I was doing this, I didn't make it a requirement. After that, I made it a requirement, and it is a very easy part of the sale. So, yes? That's right. Yep. Uh, okay. So support. So sold up front annual. Um, now that, as you probably know, in software as a service, the the uh, um, software automatically upgrades itself. But from a support standpoint, you still need to take all the calls. You, you're going to have break fixes. You're going to cover and do advanced replacement for your equipment and so forth. So there's there's plenty of reason why you need a support contract in place. Uh, you can make all those arguments. Now, when you go in the direction of physical security as a service, in terms of what you will do for your operations and efficiency, we were able to achieve what you're seeing in the upper left corner there in terms of typical support um, statistics. 50% of all our calls are handled in two hours or less. 50% of all of them in two hours or less without dispatching anybody and all remotely done. 80% were without ever dispatching a single truck. And so you, got, you were able to provide about four times faster response and about 50% fewer truck rolls with a physical security as a service model. Think about the impact to your bottom line. Think about how many more customers you could absorb with the current employees that you have. And think about how much better you could do support if you see every single one of your systems you see exactly what your customers see, and you can fix them from anywhere in the world on any, using any device. That's what physical security as a service provides you. And it turns out, you know, the mix rate that we use is about 15%. It varies between 13 and 15% of your equipment installed. The end user, yeah. Right. The end, end user price. Just the equipment. Yep. Yep. It, it comes from a blended rate of normally you would do 20% on your software and maybe 10% on your hardware. And when you blend the two together, you end up with about a, between a 13 and a 15%. So hardware as a service. So this is advanced replacement of equipment in six years. At the time that you sell your contract, try and sell the advanced replacement of the equipment. So what you're doing here is essentially pre-selling your next sale six years down the road. So you're, you're building in, you're locking in that customer because they're gonna pay you now for the next six years a small amount of money as an operating expense, and you in six years will provide them with new equipment. You've eliminated any competition of coming in at all and knocking you out of the box. And you've gotten your customer to fund your hardware. So you don't have to go into your own pocket and you don't have to go into a loss. So what we always did, we sold the equipment, we provided the services on top, and then we provided hardware as a service, and in six years, we provided them with a new system. Now, if you think, if you're wondering, well, you know, how do you know what the equipment's gonna be and all that, you're 100% right, you don't know. But you do know, roughly, that it's gonna cost significantly less because of that hardware curve that I showed you earlier. You know that for the amount that the system costs, I don't have to replace all that hardware, I just have to replace pieces of it in order to upgrade the system. And you also know that if you're getting 3% year over year on that recurring amount, it's not really 
8%, it's more like 10% that you're getting over that period of time. And I can guarantee you 100% that you will make as much money using hardware as a service to replace the equipment in six years as you did on the original install. We've done thousands of them. Now take a look at the numbers, take a look at the math. If I take uh, just the, 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 the simple one, uh, the first one, right? I just sold the system for, oh, let me take the middle one uh, for 50,000, right? Uh, yeah, me medium-sized system. So I just sold a $50,000 system. And the support amount on that, I can't see it from here, but 2K a year, okay. So now I say, I just spent $50,000 on a system. I say to my customer, for $2,000 a year, in six years, I'll replace your entire system. How does that sound to you? Sounds good. And, and that's why it works. And that's why you sell it at the time that you sell your uh, initial sale, make it at the initial sale. Because they just spent this money, and say, like, only for $2,000 you're going to replace it in six years? Yes. Where do I sign? Yes. It is a very. <laughs> um, no, you know, experience. Um, you look at you know how long cameras would last. You know, when, when would you replace a camera? Uh, when would you replace a PC? When, you know, when, when have they gone through their life cycles? Now, PCs probably before cameras. Um, there is no uh, real science, it's a, it's a, a, a wag at, at um, a, an amount of time that I want to hold the customer in place, an amount of time that I think that, I can, that they would be willing to be held in place, an amount of time that I need to incur a certain amount of money, amount of time that I, you know, I don't want to make it so expensive that they won't say no. So it's kind of all those things mixed together. Do you think it's too short or too long? Right. Yep. So, you know, there's also you have to remember that you have to put out labor to replace it. Right. So, you know, that's another component of it as well. Um, and you also have to remember that you have a service contract in place that is covering the replacement of that hardware if it fails. So really, the hardware as a service is simply a pool of money that you're putting aside. Actually, on your books, it's a liability, right? Because you can't take it as revenue. So you're sitting there building up this pool of money uh, that at, at the six-year mark, you're going to go to your customer and say, okay, this is what I'm going to replace. This is what I'm going to put these cameras in here, and I'm going to you know, put these PCs in here, and that's what I'm going to do. But uh, the reason why it's so important is because right, the software is easy, right? You're getting that. You know, we, re we have releases every two weeks brand new releases of software. Right? That's moving all the time, and that's easy to do, and everyone's running the same version of software. Hardware is a different story. It's out in the field. You, it's only as good as the day that you put it in, for the most part. So you need a way of refreshing that hardware in order to support the new software that you're coming out with at lightning speed. So it it's almost becomes mandatory. Now, I started doing this a long time ago, but there are some very notable companies that you, should, that you know are doing this right now. What does Apple do with their phones? Has anyone followed the release of their every year get a new phone? You pay one number and you get a new phone every year. That's, and I guarantee you, that, so that's hardware as a service. That's exactly what they're doing. They're locking you in. And providing value. Yes. They pay for it. It's no different than what you're doing today. Every single thing, everything, everything that you're doing today, you continue to do. It's just that you're collecting this money for a future sale. That's, that's what it is. Oh, and also, uh, I should mention, um, so you can easily prove that it's 60% less than uh, replacing the system six years from now. You have fewer uh, uh, service calls. But you can go in to any customer today and using a combination of licenses, software agreements, 
and the equipment replacement program and take over any system that's out there. So normally what, you, what we do is, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There is the pool approach, where on a, on a deal by deal basis, whoever the, the um, salesperson is that brought that in, they are attributed with that sale and they build up their recurring revenue pool. And then year over year, if they meet their sales quota, they get to tap into that pool that they are, are building. And that does a couple of things for you. Um, number one, it keeps your salespeople around forever. It's like an annuity but they have to achieve each year in order to tap into that annuity. So the, the, the more that they sell and the more that they do, the, the more stickier <laughs> those salespeople are to you because they don't want to lose that big annuity that they've worked so hard to build up. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is that you take three, somewhere between two and four times the amount of the recurring revenue and aggregate it up and say, um, I'll just use three years as an example, and say three years of recurring revenue, lump sum that up and pay them according to your commission plan based upon that, that one lump sum amount. which is why they have to achieve their sales plan in order to tap into it. Right, and keep them going. And keep them going, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so th this part, this takeover part, I just wanna make sure you guys understand. So I can go to any customer today and say, look, I will, for this amount of money, recurring revenue wise, right, which I'll give you all this capability that you don't have today, I'll provide you the same maintenance that you're paying today, and I'll replace your system every six years if you pay me this amount or more. And you can go in and afford to replace that entire system and make a ton of money over the period that you're um, contracted for. I don't think anyone's probably ever told you that in your life. Any system out there, doesn't matter. Managed services. List a whole bunch of managed services on the right. These are your typical services. When you provide um, physical security as a service, you can do all of these from any device anywhere at any time. It's just built into the platform. Now, again, you don't have to use manpower to do this. Uh, system monitoring, health monitoring, um, security monitoring, uh, video alarm response, alarm response. All those things you can provide as a license. So you provide the license to them, they pay you, and it's a DIY model, and they get all the information comes to them. Or if there's something that goes wrong or sideways with the system, it'll come to you and you can take care of it. But it's on an exception by exception basis. You don't have somebody sitting there monitoring their system. That's, that's the worst type of recurring revenue. If you have to put a person doing a job to generate money, you're in the wrong business. Personal opinion. I know people have a different opinion, some people have a different opinion, but if you remember that curve I showed you about the cost of manpower over time, you're in a no-win situation, and you can't scale. You're in much better position if you can have software do the work for you and just sit at your mailbox and collect that money. So, that's, now, I should point out that you know, I find and have used managed services as a way of winning bids and offering services that no one else can offer. So that's just something else to keep in mind strategically. Um, you can leverage your own support people during the day to do this. They can be out in the field. It doesn't matter because, again, everything comes to their mobile device. So even if you don't have a centralized support group and you have just uh, field and tech support, as long as they've got a mobile device, they can provide support from anywhere in the world. Supplies. This is a part of the business I think a lot of people miss. And we made, I used to kid with people that we were actually a paper company disguised as a security company um, because we, um, we made a tremendous amount of money on supplies. 
Now, you can make money on supplies in, in, in two ways. One is really in the visitor management side of the business, and the other is in um, just your, your access c control, um, card replenishment uh, programs and things like that. The, what I've seen is a lot of people uh, give up the supply business because their customers are going online, they know what the prices are, they can maybe get them cheaper than what you're selling and things like that. But when you move to platform as a service, you have a distinct advantage uh, over them, and that is that you know exactly how many cards they've used and exactly how many visitor badges they've used. It all comes to you. All that information is there for you. And as a result of that, you can provide a service, which is what I would call supplies as a service, where you automatically replenish their card stock and or their visitor badge stock because you know what it is. And you'll tell them, look, I will manage your card stock for you. I'll keep cards on order so you'll never run out. I know when you're getting low. I'll pre-order them as you're getting low. I'll have them. I'll take those cards. I'll put them into the system for you, and I'll ship them to you automatically. Now you're providing a service that they couldn't get anywhere else. And all that um, card uh, stock money and, and visitor badge money that you used to not get all comes to you. Now, look at the, the statistics here, or the numbers. There's one person for every 250 square feet of a facility. There are six guests for every 10,000 square feet of a facility. There's 15 to 25% attrition rate uh, a year, people leaving, cards being lost, and, and things like that. Now, look at the visitor count. So if I've got a 100,000 square foot building, 60 visitors a day, uh, 1,200 a month, I can generate $4,800 a year in that. If you take a large commercial office building in any downtown uh, location, 500,000 square feet, a million square feet, you're generating $25,000 to $50,000 a year in recurring revenue from visitor badges. Some of the largest buildings in the world, you know, we did, and we were generating $150,000 a year in just, su just supplies from one building. That's a huge, if, if you're, you want to go after it, it's an absolute great source of recurring revenue. Digital credentials, obviously, we're heading in that direction. Being able to use your mobile phone in, instead of a card, or probably just the convenience of using either is probably where it'll go, right? So, digital credentials, $4 a credential per year, year over year, to have the ability to use your phone anywhere. You do the math. Even if it's 25% of the people that take that digital credential, you're in Fat City. Tremendous amount of money in digital credentials. The secret is just making the process of getting them a DIY experience. And you can do that with physical security as a service. How am I doing on time? Pretty good still. All right. Annual increases, no big um, surprise here. But when you've got all that recurring revenue and you put annual on top of it, you'd be surprised how much money you make, especially as your recurring revenue starts to grow. You start being able to afford entire people year over year just on your in annual increases, just on your recurring revenue. And I list all the reasons that you argue to your customer that you need it. I recommend you build it into your contracts wherever you can. Some people won't allow it, most people do, and go after it. A lot of people forget it. Now the comment about yesterday about how important it is to have a very good um, accounting system. Now think about this. I've got all my customers. I've got to know what equipment they've got on site. I've got to be able to, on a customer by customer basis, provide them uh, the amount of their service contract, the amount of their hardware as a service, the, what their licenses are going to be, what potentially their managed services were, what their supplies were, and I've got to increase that every year. Can you guys do that today on, in your accounting systems? I, I know that I struggled with it for many years. So that is the comment. That's the relevance of the comment about 
getting a proper recurring. When recurring revenue is a moving target all the time, and it should be, because you should be trying to push that up as high as you possibly can. But every year, your recurring revenue for every single one of your customers should be changing, and you need to have a mechanism to be able to track that and um, provide them, you'll see, budget sheets of what they should be putting in their budget so that you get paid next year. So, putting it all together, uh, if you take everything that I just said and you line it up by all the, the categories and by system, I took the average case and then the worst case. So in the average case, 40 cents for every dollar of equipment. You can see when you sum it all up, if you're getting for each of your customers all of these forms of recurring revenue, you end up with $2.8,000 per year on the small one and $7.4 million a year on your global customers. Tremendous amount of money that you should be making. And the only difference, the only difference between what you're doing today and what I have on the board is just swapping over to a platform as a service product. That's the only difference. Everything is exactly the same. So in one case, you get it for doing what you're doing today, and the other case, you don't. That, it's that simple. It really is. That's why there is no mystery behind it. It's just you're going about the business the wrong way. So I guess the major point here is that even if you're doing the worst possible case and you're only generating uh, recurring revenue for, um, I think it shows just support and for licenses, and you do your annual increases, I consider that worst case you're still generating $2,000 a year for your smallest systems and $4.2 million a year for your global systems and that whole spectrum. So even in the worst case, you're still doing phen phenomenally well. So th that's where the generalization uh, comes from. Um, so you, this is what you should expect. This is what you should be going for in terms of your, um, your recurring revenue. So. Now we're going to move on to system examples and end user pricing. A lot of numbers here. Apologize, but uh, I'll just quickly go through them. So for access control, in the blue, it shows you what is included in the system. So this is your kind of your system definition. The licenses, the hardware that was installed, and the services. Right? The services cover all your services. They cover your project management, your installation, um, your training, uh, commissioning of the system, support dollars, uh, and equipment replacement. And the hardware for access control, it's these access control kits, readers, uh, cards, uh, a gateway, and a router to connect to the internet, and then a bunch of licenses, the platform license, access control license, intelligence, uh, notifications, power management, and system health. So those are the ones that I chose for this particular example. Then you've got different systems by the number of users and the number of readers. So, you know, your small system, uh, one reader, 50 users, $5,000 a year, and how much uh, recurring revenue you're generating, $2.169,000 uh, a year on that one reader, 50 person system. These are actual quotes that I put together using physical security as a service, you know, all the prices that you would put out there. For a 2,000 person user system with 64 readers, you're generating $9,000 a year in licenses, support of 6,300, your equipment replacement 3,800, and so you're generating nearly $30,000 a year if you got all those buckets of recurring revenue. And you know, access control, you have the ability to sell a lot of managed services. Uh, hardware as a service is easy to get. Um, you have the ability to supply, uh, to provide digital credentials and supplies. So you, for access control or physical security as a service for access control, this, you, you can really uh, pour a lot of money into each one of the buckets. And that's why, in best case, you're generating closer to 70 cents for every dollar if you, if you used all seven buckets, you'll generate closer to 70 cents for every dollar that you install. Again, uh, this presentation is going to be made available so you could study these numbers to your heart's content. 
to call me up, tell me I'm crazy. Um, but these are actual numbers that we have been getting for the last 15 years. These, these are real numbers. And in fact, the cost has come down, the license has gone up. You've seen that flip-flop that you, you were, uh, they were talking about yesterday where there's more money being put into the services as the cost of equipment comes down. But your margins are still going up. Alarms, in this case, I use the inputs from the previous access control. So um, just showing you really that you can generate more money than you would ever get from a uh, central station uh, alarm. And this doesn't preclude that. So the, the, the first two or three systems don't have any central station. The ones after that, I think after we go to eight or more, or maybe 16 alarms, they all include a connection to a central station. So not only are you providing DIY monitoring to yourself, along with perhaps getting video of what's going on and, and other information, you're also going out to a central station. This is offering you know, more like 30 cents on the dollar. Video. This is one that I think a lot of people are interested in, video as a service and, and how to do it. So a couple of things to know. Number one, you can provide it where it's going just to the cloud, or you can provide a model where it's uh, both cloud and on-prem, or just on-prem. So you have your choice of all three models. All right. And the, the licenses come to you as software as a service. So that license that you're paying for today, maybe $360 or something like that, that you're selling to the end user, you can sell that same license for $15 a month forever and ever. So it's just, you're doing exactly the same thing, you're just flopping the way that you do it. And again, making very, very high margins, 63%, so forth, 30, between 30 and 60% margins, uh, rather, uh, dollars for every um, a dollar that's installed. You also, this is a big driver of analytics as well because when you're moving to physical security as a service, what you want to do is event-based stuff, and it's all tied to analytics. So you, now you've got analytics in the cloud or analytics locally. When something actually happens, that video is then sent to wherever it needs to be sent to. So this is your typical video analytics and user pricing. Again, a spectrum of you know, 30 to 43 cents for every dollar that you put out there, and you can buy on a camera-by-camera -camera basis, license-by-license -license basis, exactly what you need. This whole model of pay as you go for what you need, when you need it, and only pay for what you use, this is what your customers want, this is what they're used to consuming, this is how they're used to consuming in their own life and in their business life. And, and it's now possible to do it in, in, in security as well. Visitor management huge in terms of um, your return. Again, mostly because of the supply side of it. You, you can generate $2.71, best case, for every dollar that you put in. Nearly three times the amount of money that you put in, you can generate mostly because of the supply side of the business. And then destination dispatch. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. This is a type of elevator system where you don't have any buttons in the cabs. You go to a kiosk and you put in the floor you want to go to and aggregates people going to the same floor in the same elevator. So we have interfaces to all six manufacturers. You can generate a tremendous amount of money with that and it's a very unique uh, niche type uh, solution. Elevator relay control, same thing. So you see all the numbers, and um, again, I would encourage you to take a look at this. Compare it to what you're selling today and what you would sell a similar system like this for. See where it stacks up in terms of uh, one-time install dollars. And what I think you'll see is that these numbers will be less money than what you're selling today. So from a competitive standpoint, you can go in and be selling this and be generating much, much more margin dollars than what you're doing today and still selling your system just like you do today. No different. You don't have to finance it. You don't have to take a loss.
So in general, you know, when you go through all the different systems and all the different averages and so forth, you end up with being able to generate on average across all systems and all different sizes about 40 cents on every dollar. That's where the, that's where the number comes from. So what happens when you do take this and you look at it over 10 years? What does your business look like? So this chart is a best case chart. It means if you, did that, if you got that average of 40 cents on every dollar and you started with just doing $500,000 a year in this type of business. And uh, I'm sorry, started with a million dollars and added $500,000 each year. So for year one, you did a million like this, a million five, two, and so forth. So after 10 years, you'd be at $5.5 million that you're doing in, in one-time business. But you'd be generating $7.8 million a year in recurring revenue. So your total, at, over, over that 10-year period, you're doing five and seven, whatever that is, 12 and 12.8 million dollars, of which 7.8 million is recurring revenue. You'll generate four times as much, four, uh, eight times as much uh, margin dollars. So if you look at the margin that you're making and you add it up each year from both the recurring revenue and what you do one time, you'll make eight times more money on your recurring revenue than you will on your one-time sales. So this should be sending bells off in your head right now. Because if you're worried about going in on your job at a 30% margin, let's say, oh, I gotta keep that 30% margin, you know, because that's what my boss told me I gotta do, whatever happened, right? And you lose the job by one margin point, or two margin points, or five margin points. You've just lost not just that margin, you've lost eight times that margin. And once you understand that, you will change the way that you bid bid go to bid. You will make sure that you win that bid every single time because you know that all this money is attached to it. And then when you look at the bottom and you look at your company value of doing it either with recurring revenue or without, and you heard yesterday from people other than me that the value is, they gave you the math, and if you take that same math and you apply it, in the case where I'm not generating recurring revenue, these guys won't even fund you. They're not, they're not interested. Your balance sheet is not fundable. If you do what I'm telling you to do, you will, if you did the math, $7.8 million, $8 million, 25X, uh, so that's $8 million a year, whatever that is per month, times 25, that's what you'll be able to borrow as a facility to grow your business. which if you do the math, it's huge, huge numbers. So you want to look for a funding source for your business to grow your business, grow your recurring revenue, use that as a, as a vehicle to fund your business through people like, uh, it was Mark and Sam. So that's, that's the worst case, I mean the best case, and then if you go down and, whoops, you look at uh, the average case, so this was the average case. Uh, $12 million in, re in recurring revenue and a, and a value of a company of $33.9 million after 10 years. Um, and the worst case is a uh, value of $25.8 million and doing $10.3 million a year. Though so again, it, it, when I talked about the forgiveness, that's what I'm talking about here. As long as you're doing the model, you will make a tremendous amount of money. It's just a matter of where you are in that scale. and you increase the value uh, tremendously. A couple of pointers on um, kind of helping the process along. We always did budget sheets for all of our customers. So in August and then again in like October, we would provide our customers with a budget sheet that showed them how much they should put in their budget next year for us. It may sound a little self-serving, it is, but believe it or not, they view it as a service. And when I started doing it, I was surprised the next year when I started getting calls, hey Pat, could you send me that budget sheet? I really needed, I'm doing my budget. 
all the time. And if I was at daylight, they'd get mad because right? we were doing their work for them. And we were telling them exactly what they wanted and what they needed to do. So this is where I get back to, you really need to know, all right, here are my licenses. You know, here's my support and preventive maintenance contract. Here's the equipment upgrade support. Here's what I need in terms of supplies, cards, badges, other consumables. And here are the, the additional projects that I want you to fund for next year because I need to, you know, we need to do this, that, or the other thing. You feather your bed. You give them a budget sheet. They put it into their budget. The money's there. If it's in there, then you're going to get your projects. So I recommend highly doing budget sheets for all your customers in this scenario. Then billing. Bill up front, bill annually. Every single one of our customers paid for the entire year in advance. And I'm talking big, big dollars. Now, when you get to $25,000 or, or more annually, I bill quarterly. If you get to $100,000 or more a year, I'd probably, they'll probably ask you to bill it monthly or maybe quarterly as well. So obviously the more that you're generating in recurring revenue from a, from a customer, um, you, can, you can afford to uh, break it down into, into smaller tranches. You just don't want to be in the collection business having to collect 12 bill, bills when you can collect one. So we billed everything in December and we got paid all of our money by February for the entire year. Talk about good cash flow. Oh, I think I'm out of time. Um, yeah, so this is just a review of everything I said. If you do everything on the left, that's the recipe. You get these results. Um, here's my last, keeping the theme with uh, the Caribbean. All right, we've given you the treasure map, right? We've shown you how to get there. We've built you the boat to use. We're providing an experienced first mate for you. We'll help you along the way. And we're underwriting and financing the journey. All you have to do is get your crew on board and set sail and get the treasure. Arr! Arr! Arr. <laughs>